You have an arrow. All right, welcome uh, those who just joined us. Sorry you had to wait for getting admitted. Uh, so today we're gonna learn the definition of interpretation in the sense of how we use it with, um, with visitors to nature centers or museums or maybe taking a guided hike. Uh, and then we're going to talk about the different types of interpretation, why we use interpretation, and, and it'll start to become more clear as we talk about that why interpretation and then we'll put into practice some of the things to create your own interpretive programs and skills and those can be built over time either on your own or as you actually participate when you are deciding that you want to interpret something or that you want to be an interpreter or you want to be a nature guide you need to understand your very own purpose in that and, and that's something deeply personal to each person. Um, why do you want to share this information? Why, what is your reason? And it's important to get that because it, it makes the experience more fulfilling to you. And when you are feeling good about what you're doing and you understand your reason for being there, it comes across in your program. So understand why you're there. Um, maybe there's a deep emotional reason. Maybe you feel it as a sense of duty because this is the only job you could get. Whatever the reason is, that's okay, but make it a reason and, and feel that reason. You may have a purpose that's outside of yourself. Um, sometimes an interpreter, uh, a guide, uh, a speaker is doing something because they're actually working towards the mission of the organization they're working for. So maybe your purpose is really to support the mission of the organization. And that's okay too. But always know what your purpose is for why you are doing the interpretation. This video here, um, I'm gonna try to play it. This was created by the National Association for Interpretation. It actually, um, these people in this video are all professional interpreters. Uh, the NAI put together this video to kind of introduce people to what interpreters do and what they look like. So I will see if this video will play for us. It's pretty cool. Interpretation is important because it allows us to build connection. Interpretation, if it comes up, it could, I don't want to keep going for it. It helps a child's eyes light up at the sight of a new animal. Interpretation promotes you to care about the community. You might not have that one. It's connecting visitors to their surroundings. Interpretation is important because it connects the past with the future, and at the same time, it connects the future with the past. It helps people to care about the resources that we bring every day to the past. Our bodies that are shaped in their world. To facilitate the conservation and understanding of our heritage. To ensure that people who live today don't forget about the meaning of the sacrifice of yesterday. It not only helps us give people a sense of place, it gives them a sense of self. Interpretation of the important interpretation is summed up in the words you know by children. We provoke, we relate, we reveal. I like to use our history to help people understand that all the issues that we've dealt with in the past are still very much with us. My name is Chris Smith. I work at the Duke Lemur Center. My name is Jonathan Spring of New Zealand. I am Amy Gaston, and I am the Associate of Brittany American City. My name is Louis and I work at the Missouri Public Foundation. I'm Rick Morales. I'm the founder of Jungle Tracks in town. My name is Jeff Corey, and I am the Greater Education Center at the Foundation. My name is Amy Erickson, and I work at the Fort Chan Park. My name is Louis Spring, and I'm the Chief Director and Principal of the Cascade. So I'm Alison Majorga, a professor of interpretation in Costa Rica and currently a PhD student at Kansas State University. My name is Toya Jure, and I work for the Office of Creation and Conservation Authority in the San Juan. My name is Jordan McGlynn, and I'm a park ranger for the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers at Palm Bay Lake in Kansas. Jeffrey Arneo, superintendent of the American Cemetery. I'm Bill Weldon. I work at Colonial Williamsburg. I am an interpreter. I am an interpreter. I am an interpreter. 
may have noticed that there were some hands that connected there. Um, I actually knew the PhD student and the Corps of Engineers Ranger that was up there, and they've gone on to do great things. So um, they got their start here with, with Kansas and Kansas State University, just like I did first. It's just inspiring that the others um, have such a great success. Okay, so let's move to the next. Now that we've kind of looked a little bit about what it is, maybe see if I can move on past that. Yeah, move, move there we go. Okay, so the NAI, um, they work really hard with a lot of uh, a lot of professionals, a lot of historians that have been a part of interpretation for a long time. They came up with, they think, the best definition of interpretation, which is left them on your screen now, a communication process that forges emotional and intellectual connections. And these words are highlighted because they're the key things about the definition. Intellectual connections between the inter interests of the audience and the inherent meanings in the resource. That's a fancy way of saying, make it, making this mean something to the people you're teaching, okay? Um, it's not just spouting facts. Facts are great, they're important, but that's just fact. It's like looking at a newspaper page not actually reading what's on it, right? You need to make it mean something to your audience. So this is, this is the widely accepted professional organization's definition of what interpretation is. And I'm gonna get into the little aspects of that a little bit as we go forward. There's different types of interpretation. Formal interpretation would be a, a formal presentation, plans, schedule, maybe even a script has been written out ahead of time. It's, it's very planned in time for with your audience. This could be maybe even a, a living history type program where you're um, showing how to brand cattle and how they branded cattle 100 years ago, what the differences might be. Um, informal is maybe you're out on the trail and someone just happens to walk by you and you get the opportunity to visit with them while they're there. You didn't schedule it. It was just serendipitous, right? You've got this opportunity. Uh, so there's two different types of, of interpretation and both of those happen to us pretty often when we're out on the trail. But there's another kind, a non-personal static interpretation where a person doesn't necessarily have to be there. So maybe it's a label on a museum exhibit or a sign on the trail that says no dogs, you know, or um, a, a map like this. So you're interpreting what people are seeing without that human body there. The importance of having that live person connection cannot be understated. I've learned, and many others will agree, people don't read. They don't read. Um, even the people that do read, are, they're like, what, half of a percent of the people that will come will actually read what you put out there. So if you have a real live breathing person there that connects with someone else, it is extremely more effective than having a sign. So um, just keep that in mind, the signage, the brochures, those are all interpretation and they're all worthy of something, but a real life person is far more effective. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about the principles of interpretation. In the video, you may have noticed that someone said, Tilden told us whatever that definition is. So Freeman Tilden, this is, this is the book that is kind of the interpreter's Bible. Um, this book was written um, by this man who is a legend in the interpretation field. It is interpreting our heritage. He laid out six principles for interpretation. 
those six principles are kind of the guide to help you know what, how to communicate with your audience, okay? So Tilden is the father of interpretation. Then <coughs> Larry Buck and Pike Cable wrote the gifts of interpretation. They took Tilden's six principles that have kind of been the framework for everything. They added a few more to make it 15 gifts of interpretation. And they've made it a little bit more um, current as far as the language, and it's a little bit <coughs> easier to read. The same six principles or gifts uh, that they both share is what I'm going to kind of talk to you about today. The main ones that I guess I think are, uh, are the most important for you to get started. If you wanted to dive in deeper to the full 15 gifts, I highly recommend um, that book. If not, um, the, I'm going to show you the basics about interpretation. So we'll get going here. Oh, and I was going to say. Yes. On, so this recording is going to go on to the content for our YouTube channel. Okay. Also on that channel are previous recordings from the table. That is true. Yes. Talking about those specific points. So. Yeah. There'll be other resources already available to you on the YouTube channel. And since I'll be up there next to Ted Cable, you can compare them, right? <laughs> Who is more entertaining? No. <laughs> Just kidding, Ted. <laughs> Um, does anybody here know him, Ted Cable? Okay, a couple of you, yeah. He, he's a wonderful person and um, very inspiring and very lucky. I think he's probably the luckiest man alive, but he's a wonderful person to know, and I learned so much from him. The first thing that is important for you to understand besides why you're there is why your audience is there and who they are. Know your audience so that you can make that connection with them. Because the gift of spark, you spark something in someone, this doesn't happen if you don't relate it to the person you're talking to. In order to relate to people, you need to know a little bit about them. Not just demographics, like this person lives in Kansas and they're 85 years old. No, you need to know why they're there, maybe a little bit of what their history is, and maybe you don't know that, and that's okay, but you may have a general sense. One of the things you need to do is kind of show up early, ask questions, get to know people. I asked Jill a few questions before you arrived and even before I got here. Who's going to be there? How many of them? So I had a little bit of awareness as to who I would be talking to um, before I actually came here. But any interpretation that does not somehow relate to what you're sharing with you know within that person that you're sharing it to it's going to be sterile because it's not going to have meaning to them okay so you need to find that meaning another way i think of the gift of spark is kind of my personal motto i don't know everything i never will ever know everything i get up in front of people and talk all the time and they expect me to know everything and i don't but my goal is to spark an inspiration among people. My goal is to spark um, curiosity. What, you know, get them so excited that they want to learn the rest on their own. So I don't have to know everything. They're going to go find out what they want to know. So that spark needs to be lit in your audience to get them interested in what you're saying. So John Falk. He uh, wrote a book about, or did a study um, about museum audiences. And I know this isn't a museum, we're talking about nature, but it is very similar, okay? Uh, it doesn't matter where you are in your leisure activities. If you're in a museum or at a library or sitting on your back porch, you're there for a reason. You have a motivation to be there. So Paul, look at those different visitor motivations at museums so that museums can better serve their visitors. Why are they there, right? So when you know your audience, that's part of it. What is their motivation for even being on the trail with you? So, rechargers. And I might add, 
These are motivational identities. They are not personality types. So these motivational identities can change throughout the course of the day. We've all had these different motivational identities depending on where we are, what our circumstances are. These are all normal parts of being a human. But the drive to be in a certain place, that's your motivational identity. Rechargers, they come out and they're there to maybe get away from people and just relax, watch the sunset. They're not there to learn anything. They're there to fulfill some emotional need that they have to break away from stress, maybe. So a recharger is there to be left alone. That's important to know because if you're standing out on a nature trail somewhere and someone, and you just start telling them all about the flowers and the rocks and the insects and everything else, they might be super annoyed because they're not there to learn about that. They're there because they want to get away from that, okay? Just take cues from people. You know, watch their behavior. Are they wanting to engage with you? It's okay to say hi. It's okay to say, can I help you with anything today? Can I answer any questions you might have? If they say no, that's okay. Let them do what they say to do. They'll come back again. And maybe next time, they'll be curious about something. Okay, another motivation. Explorers. Those are the people that are here because they heard there's a bridge over King's Creek that's the most beautiful thing they've ever seen, and they want to see if it's still there. Um, they, they're they curious about what is here. They've heard things, okay? They're here to explore. Facilitators are parents who bring their kids here to help them learn something. Or maybe they're bringing um, their spouse here so that they can share what they saw before. They're facilitating experience for someone else. There's nothing in them that feels the need to be here, to be learning something. They want the, the person they're with to learn something. So they're not necessarily gonna pick up on anything you're saying to them. They're hoping their child or their spouse or their friend is going to pick up something you're saying to them. All right, experience seekers. In fact, the Kansas State uh, Tourism uh, department, I believe, has a bucket list, okay? And you can check off. I've been there, done that, been there, done that. Those experience seekers, that's what they're doing. They're checking off a bucket list. They heard there's bison and cons that they want to see bison. Bam, checked it off. They don't want to learn necessarily. They want the experience of the place or the thing. Professional hobbyists, they're the scariest ones you'll get but they're so important to our, our experience as well. A professional hobbyist probably already knows everything you're gonna tell them. They already know. They, they are experts or they've already been here and they just wanted to come check it out again. They wanna compare um, their last experience to this experience. I mean, there's, there's, I hate to use the word judgment, but there, there is in a way some evaluation happening. So, those professional hobbyists, still important. You can still share information with them. Don't overlook that they can share information with you and be receptive to that. Okay, affinity seekers and respectful pilgrims. This is more um, the emotional connection with the place. They, they are here, there, wherever their leisure activity takes them because they are memorializing someone or they're reminiscing. There's some nostalgic value to it. Uh, they, they don't necessarily come to learn, but they come to experience a connection to those before them. So um, Falk says that people usually choose those leisure activities because they support their needs at that time. You have a choice to go anywhere. Why would you choose to go to Kansas Prairie instead of the library? Because Kansas Prairie may offer something in your needs at that moment. That the library can't, if that makes sense. Now, the gift of revelation to reveal is important as an interpreter. Information is not interpretation. I kind of touched on that earlier. Inter interpretation is revelation based upon information, but they are entirely different things. However, all interpretation includes information. So it is important for you to know what you're talking about. Absolutely. 
it is important to have data, statistics, um, scientific names of plants. Oh, that's great. It's really great. But that's not usually what's going to stick with your audience. They're not going to remember the 20 different scientific names you told them, but they might remember how this particular plant has been used by people. What it looks like. Showing them the meaning and revealing what that meaning is, is a major part of interpretation. So if you show people statistics on a chart, it's not going to mean much. So you use tangibles and intangibles to reveal meaning to your visitors, okay? So I picked this lovely building that we are sitting in to help us kind of try to connect. So when I look in this building, and we're all experiencing, except for those on Zoom, we're all, we're all experiencing a conference room, right? But it's not a conference room. That's the tangible thing that we see, feel, and are, are, we are sharing together right this moment. But this building was a barn, obviously. You can't tell that by looking out. And I don't know if it's not just a barn. And maybe some people have... Uh, experienced a barn before. And if you're not from this part of the world, you may have not experienced a stone barn. Like there's a lot of wood barns out there. So we're in Kansas, okay, in the Flint Hills. Historically speaking, there were not a lot of trees that were suitable for building a whole farm, but there's lots of stone. There's lots of limestone. It has social events. Like dances. There could have been in this very room a young man and woman who fell in love and made a family that are still producing generations that live right here in Riley County. So, this barn is a huge potential part of our history just in this county. It's not just a conference room. All right. So, when you tell a story, that's your goal is to make a connection between that thing and your person that you're talking to. Interpretation is an art. It combines a lot of different arts. Any art is teachable. You may not be the best at it, but you can learn skills, okay? You can build things. I included this picture here because I went to Washington, D.C. and I experienced the Martin Luther King Memorial and it hit me in a whole way but a lot of the other things didn't hit me. I think because it reminded me of the story. The representation here is that Martin Luther King was carved out of this mountain of despair and he's hope coming forward from this mountain of despair. So to me, this is a great representation of telling a story visually and through art, but it also represents that the story that you're telling people, you don't need to have every detail there. You only need the parts of the story that get to your purpose, that they get to the point. The storyteller that I'm about to play for you guys, he, um, he does a really good job of taking a tangible thing, an orange, and making it mean something way above this ordinary object. So I'm going to um, give you guys all an orange. You're welcome. All right, so hold on to your orange for a minute. But as the story starts to play, I want you to appreciate your orange. Look at it. Do what the man in the story is talking about, okay? Follow his lead and enjoy your orange as he's speaking. Suburbs of the suburbs of the suburbs. It was streets after streets after streets leading to freeways and I get it. I was stuck kicking buses, and as a kid growing up in LA, cars were being sacred. Buses were for leisure. They were hot, slow greenhouses on wheels. I'm the only one riding the bus. The buses are so bad, nobody rides them. And in protest, I decided I would sit in my seat reserve for elderly and handicapped. So there I was. And here comes a guy who looks like he's about 100 years old. He's walking with a camera and says to the bus driver, How much is it? It's that word, 25 cents. Guy reaches in his pocket, five, 10, 11, 12, that's it. 
I see my whole life passing before my eyes. It will be spent on this bus. Now, with a whole bus to sit on, he wants to sit where I am. So I move over to the side, I scoot over, and he sits. And he, he looks me up and down, and then he does an odd thing. He reaches into his shopping bag, and he pulls out an orange, which he holds up for me to look at. And finally he says, what do you think? And I look at the orange and say, I think it's an orange. He said, yes, it's an orange, but what do you think it is? Well, I took the orange and I looked at it, and of course, pretty much it's an orange. I looked at the orange for a long time, and he finally said, you don't understand, do you? He said, you know, I, I'm not from around here. Duh. He said, I, I came from Germany after the war. Did you study the war? I said, yeah, yeah, I learned about the war in the school. He said, yeah, yeah. He said, did you learn about the place I came from? A place called Auschwitz. And I said, in fact, I actually read an article about it. There was a big sign over the front that said, work makes free. He got very excited. He said, when you read the article, did they tell you it was black and white? And I said, um, the pictures in the article were black and white, but the place wasn't black and white. He said, no, it was black and white. He said, what I mean is that the guards wore black, black uniforms with black shiny boots. And you could look at your face and the reflection on the boots and you'd see a, a pale white face and there on the skin, the numbers. Look, he pulled up his sleeve and he said, you see these numbers? They're blue now, but when they burn them in, they were black. Everything was black, white, gray. The fence was black, the sky was gray, the snow was falling. One day it would be white, the next day the ashes from the smokestacks would turn it gray. But what I most remember was the food was gray. In a big barrel, they would cook maybe eight or nine potatoes and boil them until they dissolved. And you'd get one bowl of this each day, the black metal bowl. And if you got a piece of potato, you were lucky. So this was what we did, we worked. We waited for our gray soup and tried to stay warm. As I stay warm, I would look for paper. I could stuff the paper in my shoes or put it inside my black and white paper uniform to stay warm. And it was one day I was looking near the fence and, and what I see, there was a piece of paper like newspaper. I lifted the paper up and there in the center was something that I saw and I I had to stare at it because I, I couldn't I couldn't believe what it was. So I reached down, I grabbed it, and I hid it. And you have to understand what our treasure is with. If someone had seen me, it would have it killed me just to take it. I hid this orange inside my clothes, and in the barracks, I hid it in a crack in the wall. That night, while everyone slept, I took it out. And I held it in my, my hands. And you have to understand how hungry I was. And I had eaten nothing but potato water for six months. I wanted to eat that orange like you would eat an apple, but I knew that if I did, I would have nothing. So instead, I, I rolled it between my hands. I took my fingernail and I scratched that orange and I smelled it. As I smelled that orange, it was not in Auschwitz anymore. It was in the land called Palestine. My cousin had moved there before the war, and he had written, here we grow oranges, and the smell of these oranges fills the air with the smell of freedom. But the moment I smelled it, I was free. I opened my eyes, I, I was back in Auschwitz. I, I couldn't eat the orange, I put it back. And the next night I took it out again, and again scratched it, and again smelled it. And I told myself I wouldn't eat it until after a, a very bad day. Well, you didn't have to wait long in Auschwitz for a bad day. Came a few days later, a, a selection. A guard stood at the front of a long line. He had a gun with a bayonet on the end. He would stare at the person in front of the line and he would point right or left. Those sent to the left went to the showers and they never returned. Those to the right, went back to the barracks. He looked at me, said, I, and that night, 
I gathered those around me in the barracks and they said, I have something. And they brought it out for them. And each one looked at it as I had because you see, they had forgotten the color. And we passed it around. Each one rolled it in their hands. And finally, when it came back to me, I, I peeled it. And I gave each person a section. I closed my eyes and I ate mine. And I will tell you nothing, nothing before or since has tasted so sweet. It was the taste of, of freedom. It was the taste of hope. I gathered up the peels and I kept them. I took them out to smell each night to remind me of freedom. Before long came spring, finding the snow melted. And there through the cracks in the cement, plants came up. Tiny green plants to the guards, they were leaves. To us, they were color. Eventually, the war ended, and I came here. But you see that orange, it, it saved my life. With that, the bus stopped. He got up, and he said, young man, remember the sweet things in life. Yes, so that story, hopefully, gave some intangible feelings and, and things to you and that orange maybe bridged that gap between that man's experience and our experience. Using those senses, smell, touch, taste, that helps people connect in their brain to a certain experience. So if there's an opportunity for you to use a tangible object to reach an intangible thing, use it. It's very, very powerful. We just covered the stories, right? And the tangibles and the intangibles and making those connections with your audience so that you're revealing the true meaning of what you're talking about. So now we're gonna go with why interpretation. And most of the time we are out there interpreting, whether it's a his history or a nature, a resource, whatever it is, we are sharing our knowledge of this resource to provoke something within that audience, a change in behavior. Um, maybe you're provoking stewardship. Maybe you're provoking this person to go and share what they just learned so it spreads like wildfire and changes other people, right? But you have a reason for being there. And generally speaking, it is to provoke, to create a new behavior or idea in your audience. So you're not teaching. Okay, it goes back to the spark in my mind. You're not teaching them, you're provoking them. The information you give them, they may not remember all those little details, but they're gonna remember how they felt and they're gonna wanna share. You're gonna, so your aim, your goal is to provoke your audience. The gift of wholeness. This one's tricky. It reads, interpretation should aim to present a whole rather than a part and must address itself to the whole person rather than any phase. So confusing. Most people read this and like, what does that mean? And it is hard to explain the story that you tell and the concept that you're sharing. It's, a con it's an overarching thing that you want your audience to get. You don't want to just talk to the... Remember those motivational identities where they're there for a certain reason at that certain time and that reason can change. Those reasons change throughout maybe the course of their time with you. Don't just talk to the person thinking, oh, they're only here because they brought their child. They're just sharing with their child. Like, don't ignore that. Don't ignore the other parts of them that exist still. So you're addressing the whole person, understanding that even if their motivation for being there right at that moment is not the one that you're hoping for, those other motivations are still there. And when you address the person, you tell a story, you try to get to their very soul. You try to get into their personality and their history. You try to dig in and be a part of who they are, that whole person. Now, what it's not when it says whole is to tell everything. You could stand probably here for a week and talk about every detail of everything in this biological reserve, right? You, 
what does it mean if it's just information? You don't need to tell them everything. You need to tell them enough of the story to get them provoked, to get them interested, to like the spark, to inspire stewardship or whatever action that you're looking for. Okay? Don't tell them everything. That's not the goal of interpretation. The goal of interpretation is to get them interested so they can learn the information on their own. So, hey, look at that. Can you guys give me directions from Salina to Kansas City based on the number line? But that's all, that's everything you need, right? That's all of it, the highway system. Okay, let's cut out the part of the story we don't need. I know it's a lot harder to see, see, but you guys know the highway, right? But the point is, you don't need all of that information to get to the point, to get from one place to the other, to reach your destination. You don't need all the junk. You need only the important bits to connect the story to the provocation. Okay, targeted programs. This is fun. I, there's different age groups that you're going to encounter. There's your school groups that are going to come, maybe first, second, third, fourth grade. I don't know what age usually comes out here. So a first grade audience is way different than a sixth grade audience, right? Uh, you might not get preschoolers, but let me tell you, they're a whole different experience than any of the rest of them. And seniors, you know, are a whole different audience than young um, new parents who just got married, right? The same program that you pull out of your pocket, if you give the same program to the senior group that you gave to the preschoolers, meaning is lost, okay? The preschoolers aren't going to get anything if it's on a level where an adult is getting something. So your programs and your, your interpretive talks need to be correct, not corrected, but adjusted for your audience's knowledge and understanding and experience it today. Right, so you can adjust your programming and your schedule and, and everything to meet the needs of the audience that is going to be there. It's how you made them feel that is gonna get them to take action in the future. If they are miserably bored and they don't wanna be there, it's forced, and then you're rude to them because they're being disrespectful, that's what they're gonna remember. They're gonna remember that there was no fun out here. They, they were treated like dirt, whatever, you know? So how you treat them with respect, they're paying attention. Interpretation should help people sense the beauty in their surroundings to provide spiritual uplift and to encourage resource preservation. Again, we're provoking preservation, but in order to see the beauty in the mundane, sometimes you have to experience it for yourself. But spiders are a good example, snakes are a good example, the things that are scary and gross that you want to stomp on. These kids, um, I took these kids out on a nature experience. when I'm, They were exploring freely on their own. We had staff that were just basically hanging back watching. We didn't want to facilitate their experience. We wanted them to find things that were cool, and then come back and show it to us. They found her, this Argyo, and they wanted to squish her. Because look how big and scary. Are you good? But look what happens when I told them she's a queen in her throne waiting to be fed. Would you like to feed her? This is the result. I did it. In 15 seconds, those kids found out, wow, that is really cool. Look what she can do. And I mean, their whole attitudes changed. They started looking for more, not to kill, to feed. And, um, I know, I know that those kids are really gonna think twice or at least probably never kill a spider or a lot, not one like this for sure because they made that connection with how exciting that was. Look what she can do, look what her abilities are. And their reaction was priceless, but they saw the beauty. You know, that's fascinating. Look at that web. I mean, you point out, you help them see. 
all that information is there. All of that visual stimulation is there. You gotta stop them and make them look at it. Help them see. There's another example of, I do this at the Nature Center quite a bit. We have a little creek behind the Nature Center and it looks kind of like this top picture. And I say, what do you see? And they say, oh, I see slime or I see algae or that looks gross. And I say, okay, let's go look at it. Let's go really look at it and see what we see. This is what you see when you get close. And you get even closer, there are insects and eggs and snails and there's life in that ugly, nasty, green, slimy creek. And all of a sudden, they understand if I go wade in the mud and I step on a rock, I might be crushing a mother and her babies. But you have to get them close and help them see. If you see the whole picture, you're missing the point. So you have to narrow that focus. All right. The gift of passion. All right. Passion is the essential ingredient for powerful and effective interpretation. I think most of us, based on each, the, the talks we had earlier, we already have passion for the resource, right? We all have passion already. But sharing that passion is the priceless ingredient. That lights the spark. If you're however long ago, you started doing this for your purpose, whatever that purpose is, don't forget that and share that passion as you go along. Because the passion you have is contagious. That's going to get other people excited. That's going to get people motivated to protect, to be a steward, to share. So passion is not just your voice inflection. It's not just um, body activity. The information that you share or the, the stories that you share needs to reflect your passion as well and try to provoke passion in your audience. Because, I love this quote, in the end, we only can serve what we love. We will love only what we understand. We will understand only what we're taught. And it's highly entertaining. So we'll just give our brains a little breather with this highly entertaining. For me, nature is one of the neatest things on this planet. That's why Rodney and I started Nature Walk. Because we want everyone to know how neat nature is. Instead of just me riding on it. That's pretty neat. Without a doubt, coming out into nature is one of the neatest things there is to do. But you also have to be careful. That's why I always try to pack the heat, try to pack the gun. Just a little bit of pack some meat. Now this isn't too, this isn't much of a big boy. I don't want to kill the animal, but I do want to warn it and say, hey, I think you're pretty neat, but I respect your distance. There's bears out here, there's mountain cougars, and a biting goat. <laughs> How neat is that? That's pretty neat. <laughs> oh, wow, score! <laughs> Look at this. This is an aspen. You can tell that it's an aspen tree because the way it is. <laughs> 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 wow, what a view. <laughs> you would be a great camper to a great day to be seen in a wild animal. I used to get real excited at the opportunity to maybe see an antelope or a fox, you know, or some sort of mountain beast. So what I do sometimes is I'll try to you know, shake up, shake things up a little bit, get the earth moving, and call out to them, you know? Here you go. Up, up, up. Yeah. <laughs>
has a whole series and, and they get funnier I swear um, but yeah he you know I don't feel any more I don't know where he was I assume he was in Colorado but I, I don't know I put my own interpretation into what I was experiencing with with Lenny there um, but I didn't I can't really say I learned anything and I wasn't like provoked in any way to experience this place but I was entertained by him so <laughs> anyway um it one of the things he does do that i like to point out is um he he tries to highlight things on his nature walk nature walk that he doesn't know anything about and it's okay to focus on the things you do know about and if you have a question that comes up from your audience that you don't know the answer to it's okay to say I, i'm not sure yet but when we let me look it up it's okay to, to do that rather than this um making stuff up or or making a fool of yourself you know it, it really is okay to say i don't know all right now the nuts and bolts so i am not a math person but this one makes sense to me because i am an interpretive person um i know that when you do a, a mathematical equation you're supposed to do the parentheses first right generally okay and we know that the equation must balance we know that so what this this equation represents the formula for a great interpretation a great program so the knowledge of the resource got to know what you're talking about have to have knowledge you have to know the audience we talked about that know your audience you put those together and you add appropriate technology that might be the orange that i handed you it might be a video it might be a sound bite it might who knows the appropriate technology to fit with your audience and your resource and you get your interpretive opportunity this opportunity needs to kind of be worth the efforts on the other side of the equation if that makes sense it needs to balance so um how you develop your talk or your program you need to consider this opportunity how much effort am i going to put into learning the resource and learning my audience for like a two minute play date or something. Yeah, I don't know what I'm trying to say. So weigh out what you know and what the opportunity is and who's the best fit for that and what are the technologies that I can use to make this work. Sometimes a program takes a lot of planning ahead of time and preparation ahead of time. Sometimes in those informal instances, you've already done all the work in the past and you already know that stuff and you're really good at um, just those serendipitous experiences. Some people are built more for formal programs and some people are meant more for informal programs. You can learn both, but I always say stick with what you're good at, right? And I hope that in most cases, interpretive managers and sites recognize that some of their staff or docents or volunteers may be really good at this and kind of not so good at this and put them in where they're the strongest. We talked earlier about I think it was when we were talking about senior citizens and meeting the needs um, physically for people. Um, Maslow, I'm sure probably most of you are familiar with the hierarchy of needs. These, this hierarchy um, starts with those basic physiological needs. In order for you, for you to move on to the next uh, need in your life, you may have all these needs at the same time, and you probably do, but if one of these is not being fulfilled, you can't really move to the next level um of your experience so phys physical needs need to be met in order to feel secure in your body you know for example so when you have an audience come it is important to know what they need physically show them where the bathroom is make sure they have water or they're wearing appropriate like, clothing for the walk you know things like that so that they feel safe because if they're not feeling safe, they're not going to listen to you. They're going to be totally distracted by their hurting feet or the insects in their eyes or whatever it is, right? So try to help them be comfortable before you even start your program. And then as you get 
up on this higher level, um, you know, and you can meet needs in your program like this. Self-esteem, for example. I can help my audience build self-esteem by giving them an opportunity to experience something and excel at it. So I tend to, especially with kids, but really all audiences, ask a really easy question when you start out. One that they are, they will know, right? Ask them something really easy because that self-esteem has been met now. I knew that, this is fun. Let them be successful, that's what I'm trying to say. If you can meet this need that may seem extremely personal, self-esteem, but in your program, if you can try to achieve these layers and help you build your program or your talk with these in mind, it's, it, it's incredibly effective because it talks to that whole person, right? Okay, so we're getting, let's say you are, uh, you're gonna do a nature walk, nature walk. And um, the first thing you need to know, back to that equation kind of, that we talked about knowing the audience, you need to look at what you're working with, but inventory the resource. What do we have? What do we have here at Conda, for example? We have a public nature trail. If you, if you have the resource um, available to you that is the tall grass prairie and that's it, there's not a tree on it, inventory that. What is on this property? What can I do with this? What can I, um, or know what you have and what you have access to with your public. Develop a theme and focus all activity on that theme. So that's the story part of that. Whatever your theme is for your talk or your trail walk, <coughs> all the information that you are sharing needs to be focused on that theme. And we're gonna write a theme together so that you understand what I'm talking about when I talk about theme. <coughs> then you pick who you're gonna talk to and how you're gonna talk to them based on that theme, okay? And then, yes, the passion comes in. You present it with confidence and enthusiasm, even if you're scared to death. And even if you're nervous and you're not a person that likes to get up in front of people, um, it's okay. Pretend. It's okay. I'd say peel the band down. You're gonna be fine. So we're gonna write, oh, I think that's my next slide, this is the theme statements. All right, so this is a little tricky for some. I think most of you probably already have experienced this at some point in your life, so it won't be as hard for you as it is for younger, um, like high school and college age kids, but when you have a theme, it's not a topic, okay? Your topic is very overarching. Like, my topic is the tall grass prairie, okay? Well, what about the tall grass prairie? Your theme is gonna need to be a statement expressed in one complete sentence, and it's something that you want your audience to remember if they hear nothing else. This is what I want them to remember. So a topic, tall grass prairie, think about that. I want my audience to remember tall grass prairie. It's not quite complete, right? It's not a complete thought. I want my audience to remember the tall grass prairie is almost gone. That is a complete thought, okay? So write it in a complete sentence. Write it as what you want your audience to remember and make sure that it's whole, a whole idea, that it connects and it's not just the topic. Okay. There's the whole, it's the big arm toe jet hat. Make sense? Yes? No, it doesn't make sense until you break it apart. Its parts are what give you the whole, okay? If you try to present the whole as one big thing, you get nonsense. But if you break it up into bits, three to five sub-themes is what I'm talking about. People can remember that. They can remember your, your theme, and they can maybe remember three little sub-themes. You get past that, they just see a wall of nonsense. I had to put my little anime, animation on here. There's a pig arm and a toe jet. And a cat. Yay! But those visual connections help even make it mean more now. So compare that up there to this. This makes more sense to us because we put a visual connection with these nonsense things, right? The theme and the sub themes are doing the same thing. They're taking all that information 
they're narrowing it down to the important stuff and they're chopping it up into easily understood bits. The themes help the audience focus on what you want them to do and understand. It is important to use the word you in your themes if you can, because that's another way to connect your audience to your resource. It's also a great idea to form it in the uh, theme in the form of a question. Okay, so here's kind of the, the guidelines that I like to use um, to help me develop my theme for a program. So you select your topic. Generally, my talk is about the tall grass prairie. Then you're more specific and complete. You can fill in the blanks if you have, uh, if you want to write these down. I'm going to have you guys come up with your own. Specifically, I want to tell my audience about. The endangered ecosystem of the tall grass prairie. Now complete your theme. After hearing my presentation, I want my audience to understand that the tall grass prairie is an endangered ecosystem. So you use this pattern here to help fill in the, the thoughts to create your theme statement. And your theme statement is the overarching important thing why you're doing this what you want your audience to do so let's try it out this is a theme statement that i bet you're all familiar with only you can prevent forest fires well here on the prairie actually would say only you can prevent forests I would love that, but that's a theme <laughs> statement. Only you can prevent forests. That's awesome. I haven't heard that one. Thank you. But yes, that's a theme statement. It gets a point across. People will remember it. We all remember this. We probably, we probably heard it the first time a million years ago. Who knows? But it's still there. And we know from this statement that our actions, our knowledge, our behavior makes a difference, right? That's a theme statement. What's something you feel knowledgeable about? Your own resource that you feel like, maybe this is something I would love to talk about in a program. So write that down for me. What is your topic? Whatever it is, write your topic down. All right, so then specifically, I want to tell my audience about what what is it you want them to know about your topic so write that down and then the last thing you'll do after you figure out your topic and why you're there what you want them to know about your resource or about your topic now you can com complete your theme statement by saying after hearing my presentation i want my audience to understand that and if anyone is comfortable with sharing, I think we would all love it. If you're comfortable with sharing, um, raise your hand if you're in the chat or in the in the Zoom or here in the room. If anybody feels, I don't like pressure people into talking if they don't want to, but I also like that we can share with each other and inspire each other. Um, it might spark some new idea for someone else. Terry also would like to share those. Yes, Terry. Terry, um, can you unmute and share your story with us? Okay, I'll take a stab at it. Um, my topic is going to be about eating weeds. And what it's about is foraging native plants to eat. And I want you to be able to identify and prepare some native edible plants when we're done. Okay, so can you use, I love it. Can you take that statement that what you want them to accomplish when they're done, incorporate the word you? I want you, that's what I said, to be able to identify and prepare some native edible plants. Love it. You can prepare native plants to eat or you can learn to identify plants and eat them. Ah, yes. I'll omit the I and say, 
uh, you will be able to identify and prepare some native edible plants. Yes, perfect. So when someone signs up for your program and you have on the uh, Facebook event or whatever, that is what they can expect to gain from your program. And everything that you do in your program will lead them to that end. Very good. Anybody else have one to share? I'll share one. Okay. Um, generally, my topic is about poisonous or toxic plants. And specifically, I want to tell my audience about toxic or irritating plants native to the Flint Hills. Um, after hearing my presentation, I want you to understand that toxic and irritating features of plants are adaptations to help them survive, and you'll know how to recognize and interact, them with, interact with them with minimal harm to yourself. Okay, very good. So I think, and you can structure this however you want to, okay? You have two main ideas there that are um, not, not battling each other at all because they're related, right? And you want them to understand both of these things. Your overarching thing, theme is um, you can coexist with toxic plants. I think interpreters, docents, we, naturalists in general, we are naturally excited about what we're showing people. Um, and in that sense, or if you're an expert on something, it's so easy to overload your audience and just go on and on and on and on and on. And you, cause you're excited and you want them to know too, and you want them to be excited too. But remember, they didn't come to be an expert. They came to fulfill whatever those needs were that we talked about in the very beginning. Why are they there? What's their motivation for their leisure activity that they chose today? Maybe they say, I wanna know everything you know about badgers, do it. You know, but if otherwise don't, don't, don't um, vomit all over them, just everything you know, because it's all going to be lost. So those themes, while a pain in the rear to think about, they really do actually help you not go overboard. <laughs> it's easy for an expert to talk for days about something, but you're never going to get to share it all. And you can't expect your audience to learn it all. So use the theme in this sense. Focused, well-researched interpretation will be more powerful than longer discourse. Again, that theme helps with that. Just talking and talking and talking and talking about every single aspect of your topic does not mean as much as focusing in on a well-researched main idea that you want your audience to learn. And I love this little picture about her. She has too many tabs open. I think we've all, you know, you hear some music coming from somewhere and you're like, where is it? We kind of had that happen earlier, didn't we? So you have too much going on. It's really hard to focus on the task at hand. So close some tabs on your presentation and really just focus on the main idea and the main theme for good quality programming. And there is the most meaningful um, quote to many of us that are interpreters, um, you cannot change people's behavior without making some deep connection with them about that topic. And so it's through interpretation. So making that mean more to someone, to make them understand something is how you get stewardship and how you get behavior change. Making people feel positive about an experience or a thing and making them love, helping them see the love of it, the beauty of it, that's how you drive positive and lasting change and interpreters do that. That's why interpretation. So you can interpret nature and you can meet those ends if you just put your thoughts together in a well-formed way to help the audience make those connections. Does anybody have any questions?